Architectural history because it's one which you will not read in the books, and that has to do with the theme of this uh, this whole set of presentations here. Uh, that uh, Haiti has had a tremendous influence on uh, New Orleans and on Southern Louisiana, and we really don't know enough about that topic. So that's what we're going to talk about a little bit. And to begin, we have to talk just a touch about Creole architecture. Okay. Uh, perhaps the majority of houses which were constructed in the 18th and then in the early 19th century in New Orleans are of the Creole variety. Creole architecture differs from European architecture. These are not just European houses which have been transformed a little bit, but rather they are houses with completely un-European component parts in them. And I'm just going to mention two of those to begin with, and we'll look at the history of those two. The first one is something called the Cabinet Loggia Range. And if you look at this little diagram over there, uh, up at the top you see a series of, of basic floor plans which were uh, common in early Louisiana in the French colonial period. They began to modify those European plans by adding two curious little rooms on the back of their uh, houses. 
houses. Uh, those are called cabinet rooms here in Louisiana. And in between them was an open porch which faced the rear. And that is, in Louisiana, it's often called the tea gallery or the small gallery. And then the second component is a wide open gallery all the way across the front of the house. Uh, and that's what you see in gray there on the, on the bottom of those floor plans. And that gallery could be expanded to wrap around either one or two sides of the house or all the way around the house. And so what we have is a core which is surrounded by very un-European architectural features. So we need to talk about that a little bit. And uh, if we look at an individual house, one that's been measured, this would be kind of the floor plan. So a broad front gallery, and then either two or three rooms in the middle, uh, pretty good sized rooms, and then these tiny little rooms on the back of the house. All right, And the house might look like this, which is a house which is up in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, but has the typical floor plan you would also find here in New Orleans. All right. So uh, the first point, I guess, is that uh, several of the speakers in the earlier talks that were given today talked about how Haitian influence in Louisiana really begins about 1791 with the beginning of the Haitian Revolution. That is not true with our architecture. Our architectural influences from the Caribbean are actually much earlier than that. Uh, they go right back to the very first houses that were being constructed by French people along the Gulf Coast, even before the year that New Orleans was first laid out and settled in uh, 1722 uh, or so. Uh, so uh, what we find is evidence of very early creolization in the local houses of the French uh, and those uh, Creoles from the West Indies that they are bringing here to the Gulf Coast and Louisiana. And that same architecture moves up the Mississippi River as well, all the way up to Missouri and Illinois. So we have uh, early pictures of these houses, and we can see that they have these little cabinet rooms. Let's see if we have a, uh, if you can see the little tea gallery here and the open gallery on the front of this house on, uh, on uh, uh, Massacre Island or Dolphin Island, right? So we go to Haiti, and actually when we consider Haiti, we have to look at the entire island of Hispaniola. Uh, Hispaniola, of course, is divided between the Spanish-speaking eastern part, uh, Dominican Republic today, and the eastern, uh, uh, it, the western part, which is Haiti. Eastern part, Santo Domingo, western part is Haiti. Uh, and the early houses, houses from the colonial period that were established there, are, are of a number of different types. Uh, you had Spanish colonial houses and some French colonial houses, plantation houses, and you also have the little shotgun-like houses, which are called tikai, or small house, over there in Haiti. And originally they were found, found up in the mountains. They were the houses that the Maroon people built uh, after the slaves had escaped from the Spanish originally and then later from the French uh, and began building their own style of houses. And we'll talk about how those developed in just a minute. Okay? But the main point is that almost, not quite, but almost everybody who came to Louisiana during the colonial period came through what's now Haiti or Saint-Domingue. French ships coming from France, or from West Africa, or from Canada even, would come to the north coast of the island of Hispaniola to the, to the city of Cape Cap Asien, or Cape Haitian as it's called today, that was French Cape back then, and they would stop there and they would refit for a week, two weeks, a month or so. Uh, they would trade crews, they would trade, uh, they would sell slaves, uh, do different things, and then they would sail on to Louisiana. So while they were there in port, they acquired a great deal of knowledge about how to live comfortably in the tropics. And of course, that wisdom was simply carried with them as they came to Louisiana. So it's not surprising that even the very earliest phases of architecture here in Louisiana were strongly influenced from those French colonists who had settled there in the western third of Hispaniola. So very quickly, we're gonna talk about a number of different types of Creole architecture. Uh, raised cottages is one of them, which we have a great deal. And then we'll talk about uh, the, the New Orleans Creole Cottage, which lines the streets of the French Quarter. Uh, then we'll talk about a few stylistic elements very quickly. And then we'll talk about the shotgun house and a little bit of its history. And then if we have time, uh, we'll talk about Creole churches also. All right, so raised cottages. Here is a raised, typical raised house from the northern part of Haiti, 
Uh, this is a photograph uh, uh, taken fairly recently. And if you look at a house on, uh, on uh, Bayou St. John, on Moss Street, uh, called the Pitot House, uh, you'll see there's an amazing similarity between those two houses, right? As a matter of fact, it's even known in, in Louisiana as a West Indian style house, that Pitot House. But we can go back to the very first image that we have of a raised cottage in Louisiana, which was drawn about 1724 or so, and we can see that it's also exactly the same type of house uh, with that gallery surrounding it or surrounding part of it. And it even says that this is a two-story house with a gallery all around it. Now, try to find one of those in France. You are not gonna find one. This is straight out of the traditional architecture of the West Indies. And so if we look at some of that architecture, either in the towns or out on the uh, plain du Nord, the northern coastal plain where the sugar was grown uh, in, uh, in uh, the colony of Saint-Domingue, which became Haiti, uh, we're going to find examples from the old lithographs and drawings of this type of house. And uh, as you'll see, they're almost identical, indistinguishable from the houses which were being built here in Louisiana shortly thereafter. So this West Indian style of architecture was very prominent. But it's not the only style of architecture, of Creole architecture even, common to Louisiana and New Orleans. Uh, another one is this type of house. We're going to call this the Class II Creole House. And it's a house which developed right here in the Mississippi River Valley and in New Orleans itself. And there, those houses go back uh, a long time. They were built at the beginning of the French colonial period. And they're distinguished by having a very sharply broken roof, almost like a witch's hat type of roof on them, a steep inner pitch, and then the part that surrounds the outer galleries and the loggia spaces and so forth is a low uh, pitch. And so they have this very distinctive look to them, and they were built single story, two story, a lot of different styles of houses. But if we look at the floor plans, they have basically that same floor plan that we were talking about. A French peasant floor pan plan from Western France, uh, the Cabernet Loggia range uh, from Saint-Domingue, and that wide open gallery uh, from, uh, from Saint-Domingue uh, and ultimately from West Africa. Okay? Uh, so uh, what we're going to find is that uh, this is a house uh, that was created right here in the Mississippi Valley, it was put together from pieces which were borrowed both from Normandy, from French Canada, and from the West Indies. But it wasn't the only style of house, that, of Creole house, that was built in Louisiana. Uh, there were others, and let's call the second one the Class Three type of Creole house. Uh, and this, is, this has a much longer history, a very interesting history that goes back to the very origins of European settlement right here in the New World. Uh, and if we take a look at, for example, a picture of Columbus and his family, right? Uh, his two sons, uh, uh, and uh, one of the sons, the second son, is Diego, Diego Colon, right? And Mrs. Columbus, who isn't even named in this drawing, I don't know, poor thing. Uh, Di Diego came and built a big villa type of house on the banks of the Osama River, uh, which is in Santa Domingo City, in the year 1510. 1510, very early. And that house had certain characteristics which were neither Spanish nor French. Uh, it had uh, little corner rooms on both the front and the back, and those are called gabinetes, or offices in Spanish. And uh, then it had these open loggias, which uh, come from the Italian idea. And basically what this house is, is in a North Italian villa, a Renaissance villa. Unlike anything being built in Spain at that time, Diego, remember, an Italian family, he's going back to his Italian roots to build this type of house. The house is still there. You can go and see it today. Magnificent uh, two-story house, partly government house and partly residence. That house goes back to northern Italy, as I said. And if we look at some of those northern Italian villas and farmhouses from the 1300s and the 1400s, we can see the roots of this particular style of villa. And uh, uh, Diego Colon built his house. This is Santa Domingo City. This is the Caribbean down here. And he built his house right here. Uh, uh, but in addition to that, uh, there were lots of people who imitated this new style of architecture. They weren't building Andalusian architecture any longer. They were building this strange type of Renaissance architecture. It's symmetrical. It has big rooms in the middle and smaller rooms on the sides, right? 
And then uh, when the Cortez, who used to live in Santa Domingo City, went off and conquered Mexico, and then he, when he retired from the conquistador business, uh, what he did was to build himself a replica of Diego Colon's house. And you can see the similarity between an Italian Renaissance style villa and, uh, Chris, uh, and uh, 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 Cortez's house, okay? Now, just one more bit of arcane history here. In the year 1555, Havana was attacked by pirates. It was sacked by pirates. British and French pirates came in. And so the Spanish decided they had to do something. This was the best harbor that they had in the entire West Indies. They had to protect it, okay? So out here, uh, on this, this is the neck of Havana Harbor right here, there were a lot of houses. They had to tear those houses down in order to build a fortress, uh, the Royal Army Fortress, to protect the mouth of Havana Harbor. And so they did that. Uh, and they did a survey before they tore those houses down. And one of those surveys has survived in the archive of the Indies. That survey is the house where Mila lives. We don't know who Mila was, we've got to look him up someday. But uh, they did a nice survey of his house. This is the earliest record of a Creole house any place in the New World that we can find. Uh, sometime uh, prior to 1558 or 1560 probably, okay? And uh, you'll notice the same set of features that we've been talking about. Open rear, two cabinet rooms, gabinetes they call them, and the front gallery, and it's a symmetrical floor plan. Okay, so Spanish built hundreds and hundreds of these houses. This was the early Spanish colonial house. It was found everywhere in the Spanish world. And uh, so we can see where that, uh, with that floor plan, the core of that floor plan could be added to, you could expand it, you could, uh, it was flexible plan. How did the French get a hold of this plan? That's the question, all right? Well, if we go to northern Haiti, that uh, Plain du Nord again, we find some really funny houses. Here's a house that looks like it was built by the Romans. It's built with this big Roman flat bricks. Uh, we don't know exactly when the walls were built, but it's clearly a very ancient Spanish construction. But if we look at the roof and we look inside the roof, uh, we're going to see a floor plan, and here's that same floor plan that we've been talking about, uh, that floor plan uh, with those same features of Creole architecture. Very un-European, except for the Italian. Uh, and, but we go inside the, the roof of the house, under here, we see that it's completely French, it's not Spanish at all. And so clearly what happened is that the Spanish drove their own populations out of western and northern Hispaniola in the, in the 1580 to 1608 period uh, because they were trading with those darn Protestants too much and they didn't want to have to do that. So they left the, the walls of the houses standing, but they burned the houses down and drew, drew their population back to uh, the southern part of the island, right? And so they built lots and lots of these houses. These are just plans of Spanish colonial houses, all right? Now, in Louisiana, we begin to see the influences of this Renaissance style of architecture introduced by the Spanish very early, even before the Spanish take over Louisiana, effectively in uh, 1769 or so. Uh, and many of the houses in Louisiana have this particular type of plan. Uh, they may be surrounded by broad galleries or just have the galleries across the front, okay? And so here we have the features of Creole architecture. Loges, galleries, cabinets, uh, they, of course, the word was changed from gabinete, office, to cabinet uh, in Spanish, in French. Uh, and the evolution of the houses from small to large, okay? Um, so uh, how many houses were built like that? Surrounding New Orleans on the plantations, uh, we had dozens and dozens of houses with that Spanish colonial plan coming straight from Saint-Domingue. And in the city of New Orleans, uh, we begin to find them as well. Uh, so exactly the same type of uh, influence. And uh, for example, the Spanish Custom House, also on Moss Street on Bayou St. John, is a very good example of a raised West Indian cottage of that particular type. And you can see the floor plan, the ground floor plan, and the first floor plan. Now this is not something that could have come out of Europe. This is a, definitely a West Indian uh, tradition. 
Let's go to another type of architecture common in New Orleans. That's the Creole cottage, as it's called. Used to line the streets of the city, and uh, still many hundreds of them are to be found there in the French Quarter today. Okay? Houses look pretty much like this in the Spanish colonial period. Uh, but remember, the French were dominant, even in the Spanish colonial period, uh, e uh, even before the Great Fires and as well after the fires of 1788 and 1794. Uh, these were Spanish uh, in name only. They were actually French-style houses. If we go to the town of Capaicien today and look at those cottages, we see fantastic similarities between the old Creole cottages of New Orleans uh, and the houses of that city. So here uh, in uh, Haiti and New Orleans. Haiti, New Orleans. And, uh, little urban cottages. These are the cottages where your, your workmen, where your small merchants, uh, where your uh, everyday, everyday laboring type of person lived. Okay? And then we have something uh, which is called an abavant, or a windbreaker, actually. Uh, in, Sp in French, and uh, that seems to come directly out of the West Indies also. We find them on these urban cottages, uh, all types of cottages, for example like this. You can have a gallery with a projecting roof, and it was actually enshrined in, uh, in the uh, uh, zoning codes of the city of New Orleans in the Spanish colonial period, that you should have this projection roof uh, sticking out over the sidewalk called the banquette in New Orleans. Uh, and so that would protect passers-by from the weather as they were walking up the urban streets of the city. So uh, look like that and that and that, uh, straight out of the West Indies, an idea which was used there as well. And this is a close-up of some of them that survived. We still see them today. Okay. Uh, about some other stylistic features. A lot of our raised houses are set with large Tuscan style columns on the ground floor. Uh, and uh, those are round columns and they have an annular ring just below the capital uh, on that. And they start building those about uh, 15, six or so in Santa Domingo City. Tuscan, again, going right back to Northern Italy. Tuscan architecture is all the rage in the New World. Right? So we see many examples of those if we look at the oldest buildings. And uh, if we look at Louisiana buildings, no surprise here either. We find those Tuscan columns uh, sometimes drastically simplified on the ground floors of our plantation houses. Here they're built with brick, of course, not stone. And above them, uh, little turned colonnettes, which are really naval style columns. And uh, if we look at the back, the loges of some of our plantation houses or the front porches, uh, we see that everywhere in Louisiana, that type of column was popular in the city as well as in the countryside, right? Typical plantation house. Um, and uh, let's take one more decorative feature very quickly. It's called a plati banda. That's a word from Spanish and from Portuguese. Uh, and uh, uh, if you look at this picture, this is a, a townhouse, a little Creole cottage in Cape Haitian. And uh, if you look around the edge of it, you'll see it has kind of a flat band going all the way around the edge. That comes out of Spanish architecture, right? Spanish architectural uh, imagery. And we see that the same type of houses built here in the French Quarter in the period 1815 to 1830, roughly, have exactly that same type of decorative element surrounding the entire facade of the building, a plati banda. Not something that comes out of American architecture, even though American architecture was common there. And so if we look at uh, some, some either illustrations and paintings of these old houses or uh, the houses themselves, Many of them still survive with that. They are pretty much a mark of the 1820s. And so uh, if we look at a house like this on uh, Governor Nichols, uh, 1024 Governor Nichols Street, uh, and you look at the surround, uh, that plati bande going around it, that is evidence both of the fact that that house was built in the 1820s and it's evidence of West Indian Creole influence on the decorative features of the city of New Orleans at that time, okay? Uh, John Blatch argued 
that, uh, that many, much of the uh, architecture, and particularly the shotgun house, came from Africa. And uh, he pointed out a number of features of the early shotgun house which seemed to resemble African architecture, even though he didn't find shotgun houses themselves in Africa. He found many similarities with the style of life in West African houses and those of the little tea kai or small cottage in Haiti and the shotgun house. Right? And his theory of the origins of the shotgun house goes back to a mixture of West African preferences, particularly the open gallery on the front, and uh, the Arawak style of house, which was being built in the mountains of Haiti when the first Africans began to escape and became maroons then. Right? And so we see this transformation of houses from the Indian style house to a much more African style of house, which is still to be found in their thousands in Haiti today. It's the most common style of house in Haiti. Also, you find them in the Dominican Republic. Many of them built with wattle and dog. Now, some of these were adopted onto the plantations, and the planters used them as slave houses. So we see those houses uh, on different plantations. Here's a painting from uh, 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 1729, 1730, and uh, we see little shotgun houses uh, right there on the plantations of Haiti. Okay, and even in the towns of the period. Only difference is when the French built them, they didn't put porches on them. The French didn't I like the idea of having a porch on the front of your house. The Africans thought it was a necessity. In the towns, same thing. Lots of these little uh, tikai or small houses. Okay? Now, the amazing thing about the influence of Haiti on New Orleans is that in 1810, after about almost 10,000 Haitian refugees had arrived the previous year in the city, and several thousand prior to that, there were probably more people from Haiti in the city of New Orleans than there were native Creoles in the city of New Orleans. Right? Not all of them stayed there, but at one point, uh, there was an overwhelming uh, number of Haitian refugees living in the city of New Orleans. Okay? So when you double the population of your city in a single year, where do you put all the people? Now, what are you going to do with them? Okay. Well, when you run out of attics and other spaces, you build little tiny houses like the houses that they knew from Haiti. These are the FEMA trailers of their day. These are the houses that are being stuck in between real houses and stuck onto uh, uh, open properties and around the fringes of the city. And they look just exactly, and they're the same form of the houses that were being built in Haiti at that time. Right? So we have a whole wave of these little tiny shotgun-like houses being built there. And I'm not going to go into, I'm gonna, not going to go with all the evidence, but we have lots of early evidence which indicates uh, those houses were being built in and around the, uh, the city at the time. Uh, for example, uh, here's, here's uh, one right here, uh, right about where Noma is located today. Here's another one right here on, uh, on uh, Metairie Bayou and so forth, right? I'm going to the details, running out of time here. Uh, but uh, just we can identify who built these houses, and we know in many cases that it was Haitians who actually built these houses. They are introducing the shotgun house into New Orleans. Before the Haitians come here, no shotgun houses at all in Louisiana, not a one. After they come here, first hundreds and then thousands of shotgun houses. Right? And uh, they last up, these little tiny ones last up until about uh, 1876 or so, and they're called small shanties. You can see some of them uh, on the first uh, Sanborn maps. Uh, old shanties, they're called. And then by the next Sanborn maps, uh, I, uh, 10 years later, they're pretty much all gone. But even here on the Governor Nichols Street, old shanties. Uh, so that's that refugee housing. I don't know if our FEMA trailers are going to last that long. Uh, and then they build permanent versions of these houses, like this one. Uh, this is probably the oldest standing shotgun house in the United States. Uh, it's on, it's a 1024 Governor Nichols Street, owned by a wealthy lawyer there. Uh, you could probably buy that house today if you're interested. 
uh, cost you about 900000 or something like that, you know. Um, That's what it looks like today, right? It's been nicely upgraded. So uh, what happens is that the shotgun gets popular mainly because free women of color who are in, uh, uh, in relationships with white men and then those relationships get dissolved, they become the landladies of the city of New Orleans in the period 1810 to 1830 or so. They rent rooms, hundreds and thousands of rooms to the Anglos who are pouring into the city and the Anglos learn to live in shotgun style houses when they are introduced there. Not enough hotel rooms by any means to support all of these people. And so this is the geography let me clip through here, right here. This is the geography of New Orleans in this period. This is where these houses were being built. Uh, first in the French Quarter, this section of the French Quarter was called the Quadroon Quarter. Uh, free women of color were called quadroons very largely back then. They are the property owners. There's more business women in New Orleans in this period than in any other city in the United States. And that's because they are running the rental businesses of the city of New Orleans. And they, and they settle in Treme, of course, along the Bayou Road, all the way up here, and in what's called the Ramparts. And the Ramparts is that section outside of the quarter in Treme and in Marigny, uh, where, uh, where uh, the early Creoles were settling. And so those are the places that transformed the city of New Orleans, the architecture of the city of New Orleans. And uh, I'm going to try to end this real quickly here. Let me flip through a couple. And uh, here, are, here are just a few of the free people of color who owned property on the Bayou Road between about 1810 and about 1824 or so. This is just a few. Many of these people came from Haiti, and they were building the types of houses that they had known there in Haiti. And so various house types, like uh, this Kai en Chaumont, as it's called in Haiti, house with a high room. Uh, we find lots of those in Haiti. Guess what? Got a few of those in New Orleans, too. Surprise. And last, the churches uh, in uh, in uh, 1771, they built a big church and they decided to put galleries all around that church in downtown Port-au-Prince. It was the parish church of Port-au-Prince. It went through a series of stages and expansions, but it had galleries on the outside in all of those stages and expansions. 1774, they burned it down in 1991. Uh, 1774, guess what kind of churches they start to build in Louisiana? This is a church built for the first Acadians, the way it looked originally, right? This is one built in Natchitoches, galleries around it. Uh, one built in Point Capi Parish, right? And another one built in uh, St. Martinville. Uh, so lots and lots of influence pouring out of Haiti and being reflected at all different levels in, in Louisiana's vernacular architecture of that period. Thank you. Well, uh, Jay has uh, shown us how the built environment of New Orleans got to look the way it did. Now I want to bring up uh, Dick Spitzer, who will really kind of um, uh, drill down and focus on how the built environment here became the context in which the culture of New Orleans uh, commenced and how it blossomed into what we have right now. Because without uh, the uh, the architecture itself, and without the people from Haiti and uh, the environment to build it, uh, we have no context uh, in which uh, to develop uh, the culture that we're enjoying out here today. So now I bring to you Dr. Uh, Nick Spitzer. I think I'm going to sit here too, and uh, we're going to shift over our audio visuals, and while that's happening, um, you know, it's really always great to see what Jay's been working on, and he's worked on these things for a long time, and every time I see it, I see more, and it's, and it's incredible, and it doesn't do it justice to talk about it so briefly, but you get a feeling for the depth and the breadth of what he's done. Uh, and it's a grand, really historic, geographic tradition of work uh, that focuses on the, the material culture produced by the range of people involved in the encounter of, uh, well, uh, West Africa, uh, 
folks, Caribbean folks, Spanish, French, and now we learn we had some Italian, and I would argue, imagine probably more as roots in some of that. Um, but beyond uh, the cultural geography, um, what I want to do is, is dig into some things that we worked on a few years ago, and I got to know John Hankins through this. He was at the New Orleans Museum of Art, and uh, we were lucky he was there because he helped bring uh, really the first uh, exhi exhibition of uh, Creole and African American, as well as Irish, Italian, and other German craftspeople um, to an exhibit uh, that was put on there in 2002. It's called Raised to the Trade, um, and it dealt with uh, the artisans involved in, in making the New Orleans landscape. And uh, I would just say, you know, when we talk about Haiti and Louisiana, um, it's always a complex conversation. And as Jay noted, there's, there's so much we really don't know. But I think it's important to just kind of frame out this notion that there, there are clearly continuities um, from Haiti and, the, and throughout the West Indies to Louisiana. Um, there are also major differences um, owing to environment, owing to governance, owing to war, economy, ecology, encounters with other groups, other cultural groups in both places, relative relationships to, uh, to uh, France, uh, Spain, uh, West African ethnicities that all sort of adjust who's who and what's what, when and where. And it's interesting in the prior panel to hear these genealogies because they really speak to the tremendous diversity and yet some of the unities. And you can talk about the, the, the major migration at the beginning, at the end of the, the 18th and the beginning of the 19th century as a kind of a, a repopulating, the linguists would say relexifying, that is re-emphasizing the Haitian connection. And at the same time, you can talk more broadly about the entire um, lower Gulf South uh, and the Caribbean as being kind of a, a, an overseas uh, colonial activity where you have uh, West Africans uh, in, in, in mostly enslaved and then ultimately freed um, encountering Europeans and Native Americans. So you can talk about the totality of the region having similarities as well, not just a particular migration. And uh, the more you do that, the more you find out all the different things that are variant um, in what's there. When we did this exhibit, um, we really wanted to focus on this idea that, um, that the people who uh, are in the Seventh Ward and across uh, downtown portions of the city were not merely repairmen and, and caretakers, but had ancestral linkages uh, to people that uh, both came up in Louisiana and also came to Louisiana. We all, also, myself as a folklorist, um, I was interested in people's narratives, oral accounts of who they were, how they defined Creole, and uh, particularly because Louisiana, Southern Louisiana, has this uh, sort of image of, uh, you know, les le bon temps relais and joie de vivre and such as that, and, and deservedly so and happily so, listen to the jazz fest rolling by. But it's also an enormous amount of hard work uh, that went on here. I mean, slave labor was hard work very hard work. And that work is often not recognized in the construction of the city, and generally not recognized in American history. The work that was actually done by enslaved people, using things that they knew, losing, using things they learned, using minglings of understandings of what you do, and also depending on who you're building for and what form they wanted and how it was the result. But there's that hard work, and that doesn't mean you have to isolate the, the play side of life. And so here we have, Let's go ahead and play that track number one. Here we have Johnny St. Cyr, John A. St. Cyr. Picture of him from the 1950s. If you can crank it up, it might be a little hard to hear this. Track number one. It's kind of hard to compete with the Cajun waltz, you know. <laughs> this is a track uh, recorded with Louis Armstrong. Well, uh, Whoop, gotta go to track we, one. We, as Bocas had. That's track two. Here we go. 1925, Gut Bucket Blues. There's Louis Armstrong. So he played variations of uh, plectrum banjo and what was known as the guitanjo later, or the guitar and bantar, the guitar banjo tunings. But the interesting thing to me about Johnny St. Cyr is that throughout his life he did not focus so much on his time with Louis Armstrong as his time as a plasterer. And in the 50s, you don't see musician on one side of the card and plaster on the other. Take it from me, I saw this card. <laughs> Occasionally, you do see that crossover. But the point is that many, many people 
integral in making jazz and in the beginnings of jazz are folks that are free people of color, descended from free people of color, of course also descended from enslaved, and in descended from French and Spanish and others in this creolizing mix. And uh, this is from 1925, what you're hearing here, get boosted just for a second, probably off the banjo by now. Yes. <laughs> it's okay. Everyone gets a shout out from Armstrong. <laughs> I like that. But one of the great things about Johnny St. Cyr is that he knew Jelly Roll Morton. And if we can go to the next image, I think Jelly Roll will be here. Yeah. Um, the Jelly Roll Morton came up in a family uh, of Creoles, and, and his father had been a bricklayer. Jelly Roll did not want to be a bricklayer. He did not want to build houses, renovate houses, clear lots. He didn't want to do any of that kind of work. He wanted to play music and early on did play music, listened to everything from the Stevedores to the French Opera House. Gives accounts of hearing Mardi Gras Indians, some of the earliest accounts we've had. But, but there's Morton who kind of goes in that other direction and of course becomes famous in Storyville and travels across the country. But it, this balance of work and play is really signal, it seems to me, at the beginnings of jazz. And if you look a, a little bit at the social aid and pleasure clubs and their emergence, you know, in, in, at the beginning of Jim Crow, at the end of Reconstruction, they are defensive mechanisms that are built partly on West African and Caribbean forms of cooperative labor, but yes, they're also built in part on European guild associations, and they're kind of creolized social structures that people inhabit for work and for play, for helping people, social aid, and also for pleasure, getting out in the streets, parading, having all kinds of musical performances. Let's go to the uh, next slide, if we could. And let's go to track number two. And I'm not going to talk here any more than I already do on the track that's here from Eddie Bowe. Let's talk a little bit about your, uh, your life in New Orleans. Over the years, not only have you played music, you've done so many things. And one of the things I know you've done is you've been a craftsman. Tell me a little about your background in, in construction and crafts. Well, um, we, we as Bokaj had to learn to do uh, the craftsman when he was five. All the males had to learn how to start off and build because they were all builders and uh, I think I think we also had shipbuilders and, and we had uh, construction engineers and in the family so they taught us what what might be of interest to us and what might help us out as far as um, having another skill other than what you choose. If you choose something, if you tend to choose something else, you would always be able to fall back on that. And what skills did you learn as a builder? You know, uh, well, I, I, brick brick laying and, and uh, carpentry was was uh, basically what what my dad did, and so so I had to learn to do it too. Did you like that work when you did it, or is oh it? Yeah. yeah, yes, I love it as much as the music. Really? Yes, indeed. I. I love to stand back and look at what I've put together. When was the last time you uh, you had a hammer in your hand or a trowel? I mean, is, is it, has it been a while or is it? No, it's uh, a couple of weeks ago I was in Mississippi and uh, I had to rearrange some parts of the roof. <laughs> this is right <laughs> after Katrina. In this ca and in other case in New Orleans, I part of, a partial part of the roof blew off. So I uh, got to reconstruct that after I find an adjuster and we try to get something together. I'm going to wear my face. I'm going to be happy now in New Orleans, that place. When the sun began to shine and everybody get in that line. By now you figured out he's playing when the Saints go marching in, and I, I love the fact that he uh, he improvises on the melody, he improvises on the rhythm, he makes up new words really on the spot. Uh, in 2005, everyone had very heated hearts and were thinking about New Orleans a lot at the time. But uh, you know, it, it's it's indicative of I think of the same kind of processes you see in these houses where there's enormous amount of ability for individual transformation. Crank it up at the very end there. Right. 
He wants to be in the number. He's referring, of course, to being in that line and that sort of Afro, mm. Afro-American Christian, uh, you know, Caribbean minglings that are uh, about some of the parades that go for saints uh, and for uh, holy days and that sort of thing. And he's actually talking about returning to New Orleans. He wants to be in the number, meaning he wants to be in the city. So the complexities of how one improvises with all these elements of tradition really are creative forms of creolization. And you could, you could really an- make an analogy to the language to the food and of course to the to the built environment. I want to play you. Uh, I want to play you, Mr. O'Brien. If you can show the next slide here, and uh, you're going to see, I think, Mr. B in his uh, plasterer meets planter's hat <laughs> from the uh, the exhibit. Uh, and uh, let's go ahead and hear the next track if we can, please. Track number three. On who are the Creoles? Ninety-nine percent of the plasterers in New Orleans or in Louisiana is Creoles of color. For your audience who don't understand Creoles of color, that's a mixture of white and Negro blood or Haitian blood. That's what you call a Creole of color. So there's Mr. B telling you 99% of the plasters, but he he knows very well that on many jobs he worked, they they weren't all Creoles of color. They're African Americans, they're Italians and Germans and others. But this, I call this like mythic speech, you know. He's really bragging in a positive way about who the folks are, and I, I think that's all about style and it's a very important thing to say. And in fact, in Mr. Barthes' family, there's a debate between uh, how far back the ancestors go, how connected to Haiti they are, and how connected to Louisiana they are. And um, there's this, actually a, a current uh, grandnephew who's an historian who's been working on a Barthes line that goes to uh, before the Louisiana Purchase. But again, when you're dealing with creolization, you're dealing with which ancestors do you wish to emphasize? Are you wishing to emphasize, you know, uh, in a kind of an Afrocentric way, a certain ancestor directly from Africa? Or do you want to emphasize creolization and free people of color in Haiti or New Orleans? Uh, Do you want to emphasize the European ancestor? And this constantly happens, and it also is a matter of what records are available to people, what's been told to them, how they choose to emphasize. So you end up with very different kinds of oral histories. And the only way you get a sense, I think, of the total picture is by hearing an awful lot of oral histories and, 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 and accepting all of them as having trueness uh, in style and substance for the people that tell them. And, and that's often hard for historians to accept. Uh, and it's hard for competing factions to accept, too. I'll tell you what, I'm going to show you a few of the projects that Mr. B's family worked on over the years. Uh, just briefly, you'll see part of St. Louis Cathedral. You'll see some facades of houses in the Garden District and a few other things. I, unfortunately, I don't have his fanciest, as he would say, articular craftsman. I say as he would say, his past since uh, since uh, Katrina, sadly, as has Eddie Bo. But uh, if you could go ahead and uh, let's go to the next audio track, and then we'll look at these slides as we go. Next track, please. That's track uh, four. Well, I came from a little place to call Nice. Nice, France. It's on the Mediterranean. And from there, my great-great-grandfather, I was told, stopped in Haiti. And he met a beautiful Haitian woman who came here to New Orleans. And uh, that's, I think, where they got started from, all days. We go back, we say 1850. Uh, my dad naturally passed all this information down to me and I pass it down to my children, and Trudy passes it down to Lauren, my granddaughter, and we hope it'll continue like that. Uh, It's something you should know, living in the South, living in New Orleans, that the Barthes, in 1901, organized the Plasters Union. So you might say, what's so great about that? It was integrated. That's what's so great about it. Pull that down. And it's we can pull that down and we'll go to the next track in a second. I have to tell you, the integration he's talking about is, is essentially uh, Creoles of color with uh, Europeans, uh, with Irish and Italian. He's not talking about African Americans or people who are identified as freedmen, that is, descended from slaves, whether they speak French or English. He's talking about the Creoles of color who were free people before the Civil War. So these are the people who have FPC, free person of color, on the census marker at that time. There is a later integration when he ran the union in the 1970s in 
he did integrate and include African Americans. So Mr. B's intentions were always wonderful and inclusive, but that but that's kind of the detailing of that history. Now let's hear him talk, if we can go to this next track full of, uh, about his own ancestry as he sees it in the city. Yeah, it was a very good plaster. He was very good. He had a son by the name of Alexon. He was a super plasterer, carpenter, plumber. He had the gift of all gifts. Uh, that was Alexon. And it's said that he was even greater than Peter or Leon. And Alexon had four sons, Paul, Louis, Henry, and Alvin. And they say that Alvin was just as good as Alexon or Alexander, they called him Elec. Earl's ancestor. We're gonna bring that down for now and just uh, running out of time a little bit, but the great thing about Mr. B was that even though he wasn't involved in music, he thought very musically about his work and often talked about it in musical terms. And on the job, he'd be listening to Ray Charles and Lowell Folsom style blues, but then he'd also turn on opera and loved Carmen because his sister was an opera singer. So many of the Creoles of color really had this amazing range of identifications with the aesthetics of both you know, African, African Caribbean, African American, and then you know, French and European cultural style. And in doing the work, they ran the gamut from interiors of shotgun houses in some cases to grand mansions, which is you, what you mainly saw. I'll show you an in interesting interior of a shotgun um, in a moment or so. But uh, I think we better move on in the interest of time. And if we can go to the next slide and hear track six. There's Milford Dolio, one of the guys that worked with him, drummer and onward. This seven on one here was Teddy Montana. You build a house, didn't have to spend no money at all, other than for the material. Your new plasters, your new lathers, your new carpenters. The wife would cook a big old pot of red bean and rice or something like that. And get a quarter keg of beer and they have it ice cold. And the guys would just work and it didn't cost you nothing. At age 16, Tootie Montana started a trade that he would work in for 48 years. Whenever you mention your lap, L-A-T-H-E-R, people always say, well, uh, what that is? See, we don't want to prepare the jobs for the plasters. The plasters put their plaster on the work that we put up. I've been plaster too, but I don't call myself a plasterer. I wouldn't take a job as a plasterer. I'm a lather. We fade Tootie down for the moment. Of course, he's passed on, and many of you know him as uh, the great uh, chief of uh, the Yellow Pocahontas over the years, the chief of the city, as he used to say. And uh, this is his picture for that raise to the trade exhibit, and we'll see him in another uh, suit in just a moment. Um, but I wanted to note that he points out cooperative labor. If you go to rural French Louisiana, Cajun and Creole, you hear people talk about coup de main, where they get together, literally, literally blow of the hand and cooperate. And in this setting, in the seventh ward, probably more cooperative labor among social aid and pleasure club members to build houses not unlike some of the cooperative labor associations, uh, you know, in, in Haiti, uh, Martinique, St. Lucia, that emerge, again, out of certain types of West African lineages and also out of European lineages, but especially that community cooperation seems to have the, the West African root. Back up one slide, if you don't mind. I just want to say one thing about the interior. Whoop, the other way. We'll see Tootie in a minute. Um, th this is what, what Mr. Bartha used to refer to as the little guy with the Cadillac finish. Uh, here's a shotgun house with a gigantic Saturn blaster medallion in it. And apparently the guy that did this did the medallion, I think, in the St. Anne Motel, Hotel uh, down on, uh, I guess that's Decatur Street. And, uh, you know, evidence that people were using the stuff in their own homes by the time they become decorative uh, artisan folk. And uh, Montana himself, I wish I had a picture of his house because he had this gigantic dome in the middle of his shotgun that he sat under and used to say he visualized. Now let's go ahead two slides and see Montana in, in his uh, guys in his Mardi Gras Indian suit, as he would call it, and pay close attention to those scrolls along the waist there. And if we can, can go to the next picture, please. Okay, Hotel Le Pavillon. Montana worked on this piece, uh, and if you travel the city, there's other places he worked. Of course, none of this work gets signed. Um, his major work seems to be uh, in the interior of the Monteleone Hotel ceiling in the lobby. Um, but this one he worked on with a, a crew that included Irish and Italian guys. And the question that I raised with him once is, you know, wh wh what's, what came first, your scroll on your costume or the scroll on the side of the Le Pavillon? 
And you know, he was always a little cloudy about that, but he always did tell me that he dreamed his costume. So what, do you dream your work or do you work your dreams? Uh, I think Montana was somebody that did a bit of both. And uh, let's just go back one more time ahead. There we go. Um, you know, I never can pass the Le Pavillon Hotel and not think about Tootie Montana. And if you go down to the Backstreet Museum, you will see a uh, building tradesmen who are also Indians who have built houses and castles into their costumes. So this, this play between work and play, this creative play, is, it is all over the place. Um, I'll tell you what, I'm running a little short of time. I'm gonna, I, let's advance uh, to, uh, let's look at some, let's just look at a few images real quickly here if we can. And then we'll advance to track eight. Uh, going forward, yeah, forward. Um, you know, obviously the second lines in Social Aid and Pleasure Club now include a more recent a group forming uh, in the late 80s, the Black Men of Labor, their annual Labor Day parade, honoring the laborers, consciousness of the labor, consciousness of uh, Creoles of color, Afro-Creoles, African-Americans, um, keep going. And uh, uh, the second lines themselves, arguably coming out of a mingling of, of some of these cooperative labor groups and cooperative social organizations with uh, Haitian and West African origins, but also origins in, in European notions of Saints Day parades and cooperative groups. There were German social aid and pleasure clubs in this town, Irish and Italian social aid and pleasure clubs. It's just that they haven't persisted as strongly and they're not as closely associated with jazz as are the uh, clubs associated with the Creoles of color and African Americans. Another slide, please. And if you know a little of the recent history of New Orleans, you know that the second lines have been instrumental in getting helping get people back into the city and engage together uh, politically and socially. And one more, uh, it being painted by Charles Gillum, who will be here next week as a painter and a carver, passing a shotgun house, I might add. <laughs> and one more, and on the side of his house. And then again, one more. And that gets us to Mr. Furbos, and I'll try and wrap up with him a little bit. Um, Let's, let's play track number eight if we can with Lionel Furbo's uh, now 98 and the oldest active musician in the city, trumpet player, but also a tinsmith. If you want track eight. Here we go. Let me take you back on the other side of your life. You've been uh, a metal worker. Right. Well, let me tell you, my grandfather was a sheet metal man, my dad was a sheet metal man. Now, what kind of things uh, did you make as a sheet metal man, as a oh, tinsmith? We, we made a lot of uh, air conditioned ductwork. Mm -hmm. That's important in New Orleans, I gotta tell people, because yeah. like, we need air conditioning. We made uh, uh, gutters, we made funnels. Funnels? How about street lamps? Did you ever make street oh, lamps? Oh, yeah. There's one that we repaired, and uh, it, it's right on the corner of uh, Frenchman and Decatur. So, if I went to Frenchman and Decatur right now, I could go find a Lionel Furbos street right. lamp. That you did the work on that. Is that in copper? Yeah, in copper. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I remember one time Danny Boca said. Uh, the banjo player. Yeah, he said, uh, I know four boss is something that not only he worked on hot room, but he worked in hot clubs. <laughs> <laughs> and there's, uh, there's Lionel Furbos in 1928 with ha uh, Handy's, Captain Handy's Merrymakers. Next slide, please. And with the black WPA band, last surviving member from the early 30s. And let's go ahead and jump ahead to the next track if we can. This is him actually getting ready to sing St. James Infirmary. And here he is with uncles and cousins in his tinsmithing outfit, as opposed to his bandstand outfit. This was on the occasion of his 95th birthday that he's performing this down at Snug Harbor now four years ago. These with an all Creole band, the Mighty Four, Lionel Furbos on trumpet, Harold Dejan. We heard from uh, Maurice Dejan earlier talking about the Dejan family linkages there. Uh, he's on saxophone, he has since passed, famous band leader. Creole George Gaynon on uh, banjo. And who am I missing over there? Alec Bigard there on the drums. Um, 
We have one more slide ahead. Here is Mr. Furbos on his special day uh, for the exhibit in his dress outfit, but also what he wears up on stage. And uh, he correlates his ancestry to uh, a fair bois, he would say, in France. But of course, he's very aware of the, the connection of people of color uh, from Haiti and in the original uh, Louisiana settlement, and talks about that as well in, in any narrative of his life. Um, let's jump ahead of, and bring it full up, and let's jump ahead to the last track number 10, if we can, please. Is it important to look good up there on the bandstand? Yeah, to me, to me, your appearance is, is the first thing that Looking good on the see. bandstand. And then the appearance can, can outclass even some bad playing. <laughs> So you are the oldest living musician actually playing in New Orleans. Yeah. And there's a lot of younger people that have given this up. Oh yeah, well, well uh, uh, I was talking with the fellow right down here, uh, and he said, he don't understand how to play 95 years old, I still have a lip. So how do you still have a lip? I don't know, it, it just is that. <laughs> you see, uh, I practice. But you're still practicing? Oh yeah, because you, you would never lip at all if you didn't practice. You know, I love the idea that a 98-year-old made us practicing. Uh, I love the fact that he worked as a tinsmith or metalsmith till he was 75, but still holds metal in his hand every weekend down there at Palm Court. That is the trumpet, and he carries on. And let's see if there's another image or two here of him. Uh, just his hands, which I think uh, maybe deserve all the attention. Um, he, just one of the great people in the city, and all these craftspeople really were emblematic of the chance to rebuild and return to the city, both in their musical endeavors and in their work endeavors. And in a way, I think their voices are more important than ever as New Orleans faces the future and how it will rebuild uh, and, and how it will create uh, housing again. And I think we're beginning to get that kind of dialogue here. And, and, and that means that you learn about Haiti and West Africa the rest of the Caribbean and the rest of the Gulf Coast and the complexities of continuities from Africa, from France, from Spain, uh, the creolization, life in America, the similarities and differences that we have as human beings uh, with culture that expresses all those things so well that this entire surround of us is dedicated to. Thank you for listening. Well, we want to thank you all for uh, being with us here. And technically, we are a little bit over time, but if anyone has uh, questions, we are still here. Yes, sir. Yeah. For the architect, uh, I'm David Stack. I, I grew up in the corner of Earth Park and St. Bernard, Abbey Manual, Preston, Great Grandson. I, have, I grew up on Earth Park and St. Bernard, Abbey Manual, Preston, Great Grandson. I don't know, I figured it's Sam, Sam, and York But the thing that tr strikes me, that I have no argument with Haiti and New Orleans social connection. That helps me. Should I begin over? I said, okay, I happen to be, I'm David Sasher. I grew up on Earthport in St. Bernard. I happen to be Emmanuel Perez's great grandson. I live now in 106 in Amsterdam and Manhattan. And while I have no quarrel with the Haiti cultural, New Orleans cultural connection, I think it's a semantic error that it, covering, it covers up a profound uh, flaw which is that in the 1800s, especially when the architect is talking about, there was no political entity known as Haiti. It was Santa Domingo or Hispaniola. And, and growing up and, uh, and living in Manhattan in, in the center of little Dominican Republic, as I'd walk down the street, I'd see things in the street, people, and I think, it's just like New Orleans. Just, I mean, people looked like New Orleanians, they did things like on the streets and culturally that was still in New Orleans. And I think focusing on the western part of the island, ignoring the western part, and as many people came from there as from the Eastern Point, I think you're missing half the story. And I just want to comment. The other thing I wanted to ask you about the shotgun uh, architectural style is to the extent to which the narrow lots that were created in New Orleans because of the scarcity of land made a uh, uh, catalyze the ubiquitousness of that style. You know, that, that style was adapted because it was appropriate to the type of lots that the city was subdivided at the time. And that's a statement and question. Okay. Uh, see if I can get some. Okay. Am I there? There we go. Okay. Uh, well, that's a couple questions. I'll try to answer as best I can. Um, for uh, Sandomang in Haiti, of course, the lang the uh, the uh, language is is complex. Uh, Haiti begins in 1804. 
And so anything, the largest number of Haitian refugees came to New Orleans after Haiti was already a country. It was officially Haiti in 1804, right? Uh, but before that, Saint-Domingue, you're absolutely right. And so uh, you, you should be careful about uh, talking about that, but because so few people know about Saint-Domingue and even the pronunciation of it, uh, we tend to use Haiti as a kind of a blanket. And uh, you, but semantically, you're absolutely correct. Uh, you, we have to be very careful about that. Uh, I've been looking at the history of the shotgun house and where they were built and when they were built. Uh, the first shotgun houses were not built on narrow lots. Most of them were built around the fringes of the city. Uh, they, uh, and then later on, uh, many shotgun houses were built between Creole cottages on lots where you could have put another Creole cottage if you had so wanted to. So the narrow lots theory, Sam Wilson's theory, uh, that accounts for a, num a portion of the popularity of the shotgun house, but it is by far not the only theme in that story. Uh, the development of the shotgun house is very complex, and cultural preferences played a very large role uh, coming in uh, with those uh, Haitian and uh, Saint Domingue refugees. Uh, and you had another question, I'm sorry. Well, I, I guess that, that, uh, that Spanish culture of the eastern part of the island, yeah. and, and especially since New Orleans was a Spanish colony at the time, and it, that, that is it overlooked, or just, I mean, is, do you, are the focus strictly on the western part of the island yeah. to the exclusion of the eastern part? Well, I was trying to point out that it was originally Spanish culture taken over by the French. Uh, Spanish culture had its influence in Louisiana before the Spanish came to Louisiana, before 1765. Uh, we were already building those Renaissance-style plantation houses here, and so the French had already been influenced in Western Hispaniola by Spanish taste uh, before that time, right? And uh, so and I, I think it probably was uh, multiplied a little bit after the Spanish took Louisiana, but uh, you know, it's, it's a complex story again. Most areas use what's ever available in the area to build with. Where is the prominence of, why, why did the iron railings evolve? Is there a lot of iron ore around here? Or is it hard to they import it? Or? Yeah, um, I, I, wrought iron railings, which were fabricated by hand by blacksmiths, largely African-American blacksmiths, uh, they were popular from almost the beginning of the colonial period, uh, if you could afford them. They were a symbol of, of economic uh, success. And if you can afford them, you put them on your buildings, both in the West Indies and in, here in Louisiana, and very widely in the colonial world, and in France and Spain as well. Really, those traditions come out of France and Spain, but the traditions of ironworking, part of them come out of West Africa as well, right? And then uh, Baroness Pontalba in uh, 1849, she kind of introduces the cast iron uh, uh, balconies to Louisiana, bringing a style which was already being used in New York a little bit down to Louisiana. And we just happened to have been so poor in New Orleans that we didn't tear all ours down. Other cities have urbanized and torn all of that stuff out of the heart of the cities. We didn't do that, luckily, here in New Orleans. So we still have both of those wonderful forms of decoration on the buildings. Where did you get the uh, raw material originally from? Uh, where did the iron come from? Uh, originally, the very, in the very first early part of the French colonial period, it was shipped in from France. Uh, and they shipped in rods, rods 10 feet long, uh, square rods, uh, which were fabricated in mills in France. And then later on, of course, rather quickly, uh, they started uh, trading with Philadelphia and uh, New England and, and getting the iron from closer sources. Just with a musician now, I, as I said, I was descended from Manuel Perez, and my mother's done the genealogy, and one of Perez's ancestors was a fair boss. And so I wondered if fair boss, it, 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 did he ever mention Manuel Perez, who was also a trumpet player when you were interviewing? Do, do you know, any, do you, are you aware of any connection between the two? No, whoa. <laughs> uh, he never, he never did. Um, Dave Bartholomew did, <laughs> talking to him, because he, you know, he knew him. Uh, you know, fair boss, um, 
operated inside a special little environment, and he still does. Um, he's a reader of music. He used a, a Warlines method book. He's not an improviser. He's really more of an old school, almost European format player. As was Manuel jazz. Perez, I should say. <laughs> yeah, is that right? But, but, but Perez has wider notoriety as a professional musician, uh, and so was known more across the cityscape, and Furbos is probably a little more interior to his particular circuit, but, but he never did mention that, but I didn't really do every ancestor just, and relationship. I, I know there was a, there's a Furbos in that ancestry, yeah. and I just wondered if there were collateral. Well, well, you, you know, uh, I'll go back, and you being a native New Orleanian, you'll, you'll go for this or get it, I think, is, uh, you know, there's an old joke in New Orleans that a, uh, a trumpet a band is going down the street, and there's a great trumpet player, and there's two guys standing on the corner, and one says, hey, look, that's how you call it. And the other guy says, no, 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 that's how you call it's cousin. And, and I think, it, you know, <laughs> it speaks to the intimacy and familiarity, and also the complexity of who's who and who's kin to who, when, where, and how, and who's playing the music and who's famous for it, et cetera. So, but with Mr. F I, I will ask him next time I see him. I see him all the time. So I'm, I'm glad you brought it up. Well, uh, if there are no more questions, I really want to thank you all uh, for uh, being a part of this uh, presentation. And how about giving a great hand to uh, Mr. Yeah. 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 Yeah.